Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the New Directions in Small Cell Lung Cancer webinar. We will spend the next hour or so hearing the inspirational stories of two small cell survivors and being updated on new treatments approved and on the horizon for the disease. I'm Jennifer King, the Director of Science of Research at Lung Cancer Alliance. Lung Cancer Alliance is a national nonprofit organization based in Washington, D.C., that listens to and serves those living with and at risk for lung cancer to reduce stigma, improve quality of life, and increase survival. We offer a host of programs and services designed to educate, improve care, and increase quality of life for the lung cancer community. For more information, you can visit our website at www.lungcanceralliance.org. Before we begin, we want to recognize our supporters, Abby, Bristol Myers Squibb, and Genentech. Without them, this webinar would not be possible, so a big thank you. The goal of this webinar is to help you understand small cell lung cancer, learn about new and emerging research into the disease, and hear from two survivors. To help you remember the information presented today, the webinar will be archived, so you can watch it anytime you like, and we will also make a summary blog available. Please know that Lung Cancer Alliance is here to help. We can answer your questions about lung cancer, help you find your best care, understand your treatment options, find support, and so much more. Don't hesitate to call our toll-free helpline at 1-800-298-2436 or email us at support at lungcanceralliance.org. It's now my honor to introduce you to our three expert presenters who will help us understand the current state of lung cancer and share their personal journey. Tony Forrester has lived on Long Island since her early teens. She got her RN degree from Pilgrim Psychiatric Center School of Nursing and embarked on a 38-year career as a nurse practitioner, administrator, and professor of nursing. Tony was diagnosed with limited stage small cell lung cancer at the age of 38. After treatment ended, she returned to school and got both her master's degree and doctorate in nursing at SUNY Stony Brook. Tony's been happily married for 41 years to a wonderful partner. She has no children but many nephews. An avid gardener, beach lover, reader, and mahjong player, Tony retired in May of this year, but continues to serve as a guest lecturer and consultant as an, on an as-needed basis. Dr. Leora Horn is an associate professor of cancer research and clinical director of the Thoracic Oncology Program at Vanderbilt Ingram Cancer Center. She received her bachelor and master's of science in pharmacology from the University of Toronto, where she also attended medical school and trained in internal medicine and medical oncology. She completed a subspecialty fellowship in thoracic oncology at Vanderbilt University. Dr. Horn's clinical practice focuses primarily on the care of patients with lung cancer, and she's principal investigator on several lung cancer clinical trials and educational projects, including a recent immunotherapy study. She was the first author in New England Journal of Medicine that she's going to talk about today. Nina Beatty is a licensed creative arts therapist in New York. She received her Bachelor of Fine Arts in Film from New York University, undertook graduate study in painting and art history from Hunter College, and graduated from the School of Art Institute of Chicago with her Master's of Arts in Art Therapy. Throughout her career, Nina has focused on helping those with medical challenges and has worked with a wide range of populations. Since her diagnosis, Nina has become an ambassador of the lung cancer community, sharing her story widely in person through video and in print, including a presentation at American Thoracic Society's International Conference. In 2017, Nina created 18 animated emojis that other cancer patients can use to stay in touch with their friends and families. She also gives back by volunteering with Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center's one-on-one -on -one patient support program, where she exchanges experiences and fosters hope for others with lung cancer by phone. So here's today's agenda. First, Tony will tell us about her journey with lung cancer and experiences as a 26-year survivor. After that, Dr. Horn will give us an overview and update on small cell lung cancer and the new emerging approaches to treatment. We will end with Nina's experiences with small cell lung cancer, including one of those new approaches discussed by Dr. Horn. After the presentations, our experts will answer your questions. You can ask them as they come by typing them into the area, the chat area on the right side of your screen. Before I, before I turn it over to Tony to share her story, we also want to thank Nina for sharing the artwork that you will see in the presentations of Tony and of herself. 
So, Tony, it's time for you to start. Welcome. Thank you very much, and welcome to all. Uh, my name is Tony Foster, and uh, I happen to have been diagnosed in 1992 with small cell lung cancer at uh, a limited stage. I was 38 at the time. I was already a registered nurse and clearly understood the prognosis. I am considered a long-term survivor, and it has been a challenging, often frightening, and interesting process. I think fear of dying often comes with any cancer diagnosis, but is particularly strong with small cell lung cancer. For me, guilt was the most difficult part of the experience. You see, I had been a smoker for 19 years and knew I ran the risk of a lung cancer diagnosis. My husband in particular had begged me to quit smoking for many years, having watched his mother die from the disease. My denial and arrogance obstructed any small attempts to try to quit smoking. I quit only after I was sure that the lung cancer diagnosis was clear. After it was hard to look at the faces of those who loved me, and I became overwhelmed with that and sunk into a depression. I didn't shop for new clothes for two years because I believed that I was going to die in a short time. So what was the point? Well-meaning medical and nursing colleagues in efforts to provide support would send or direct me to areas that would provide information about small cell, except that at the time, uh, 26 years ago, the information was dismal and actually reinforced my feelings that I was going to die. While sharing my appreciation for their good intentions, I asked that they not forward me anything that was negative a first for me in learning to be assertive, I must say. When I was diagnosed, the only treatment options were chemotherapy and radiation. My chemo treatments lasted six months or so, and I had had 45 radiation treatments to the chest. I also had 15 treatments of PCI, which is prophylactic cranial irradiation, to the brain to fend off any metastasis. And I learned how to speak Chinese after that. Ha uh ha. -huh. In spite of the difficulties I faced, faced, I still had hope. The hope I held on to was built into the support and love from my husband, other family, and friends. They reinforced healing practices such as meditation, Reiki, exercise, and energy healing, all of which I still practice to this day. This was especially important because once my active treatments of chemo and radiation ended, I found myself endlessly ruminating about the cancer reoccurring. Once the smoke cleared, so to speak, I realized I needed a fast track to rebuild hope and control of my life. A return to school was the answer for me. The intensity in these academic, academic programs actually reduced my anxiety around reoccurrence and dying. I wasn't thinking about dying so much, and I eventually got both a master and doctorate degrees in nursing with a psychiatric specialty. My clinical focus uh, was the medically or surgically challenged person. And so I believe that my own experience of illness, anxiety, grief, and guilt as a result of illness has allowed me to be a better practitioner and a more evolved person. In addition, I've been nicely connected to the Lung Cancer Alliance since its inception, volunteering as a phone buddy, which I have found to be very gratifying. I have been luckily cancer-free since 1992. However, sadly, the stigma remains. To this day, when I share my diagnosis, which I often do not, uh, because I am asked, uh, frequently if I smoked. I see the judgment in uh, their eyes, mostly unspoken, but at times more direct, saying, really, you should have known better, Tony, as if I didn't know this. As a community, we need to work more to educate society about lung cancer to eliminate the stigma survivors often ex experience. Recent compelling lung cancer screening programs have been terrific for people at risk for this disease as well as providing a screening feature as in other cancers. 
There are more new treatments for non-small lung cancer than ever before, and a new treatment for small cell was recently approved. Dr. Horn will now help us understand advances in small cell research, happily, and emerging treatments. Today, lung cancer, the cancer that had been marginalized, is finally being researched, screened, and treated more like other cancers, and that is good for all of us. As my Italian mother would say, hey, who's better than you? Nobody. Anyway, that's my story, and so, Dr. Horn, take it away. Thank you. So um, I want to thank you for your story, and um, I'm going to talk about some of the new treatments and um, pro uh, progress that we've made um, in lung cancer, and I just lost my screen. Okay, we're fixing that. Hold on. Okay. Still can't see anything. Okay, we've got it back up here. Okay. Okay, I got it. Um, so thinking about some of the progress and some of the promise that we have um, in lung cancer treatment. Um, if you want to go to the next slide. So when we think of lung cancer, there are multiple different subtypes of lung cancer. There's non-small cell lung cancer, and there's small cell lung cancer. And non-small cell lung cancer is seen in about 85% of lung cancer patients, and we think about it as squamous and non-squamous. And then small cell lung cancer is not broken down. We see that in about 15% of lung cancer patients. Um, and so while it is a less common form of lung cancer than non-small cell lung cancer, we see that it is still a significant number of lung cancer patients diagnosed every year, over 30,000 patients in the United States. When we look at small cell lung cancer, the good news is that small cell lung cancer rates are going down, and that really has gone down with the Surgeon General back in the 1960s and the warning that small cell lung cancer and lung cancer in general is associated with um, cigarette consumption. And while we generally think of non-small cell lung cancer as occurring in both smokers and never smokers, we generally think of small cell lung cancer occurring primarily in people with a history of smoking, although I will highlight that the majority of patients who are diagnosed with lung cancer today are, are either um, are, are, are former smokers, not current smokers. As I mentioned, 98% of small cell lung cancer is smoking-related, and when we think about the other 2% of patients, that are, those are often people who have some sort of work-related exposure, people who worked, for example, in nuclear plants, maybe had um, a significant amount of radon or chemical ex exposure. Although screening has become more common um, in the United States, unfortunately, only a minority of eligible patients are screened. And so small cell lung cancer being a more aggressive disease, less than one-third of patients present with early stage or curative disease. And for small cell lung cancer, while there are curative treatment options, surgery is often not an option. The majority of the patients that I see will be treated with a combination of radiation and chemotherapy, but we have to be careful about treatment because many, many patients will have other smoking-related health concerns. Platinum-based chemotherapy, either carboplatinum or cisplatinum with etoposide, along with radiation therapy, is the first-line therapy for patients with curative disease, and carboplatinum and etoposide for a long time was the first-line therapy even in patients with advanced-stage disease. This type of cancer tends to be a very uh, responsive to upfront chemotherapy, but recurrence is very common, and relapse can occur within the first one to two years. And while we had for a long time agreement on first-line therapy, second-line therapy options have remained minimal. This is just a diagram showing us the staging of small cell lung cancer. When you talk to cancer patients, they'll often talk about their stage of disease being stage one, two, or three. And for a long time, small cell lung cancer was staged as limited stage disease, which correlated with stage one, two, and three cancer, cancer that was treatable and curable, within a single radiation port. 
An extensive stage disease is what we would correlate with stage 3B or 4 disease at where a tumor is in more than one area that we can't encompass all of that within a single radiation field. And while the old numbers that we see, the five-year survival rates with early stage disease of being 10 to 13 percent at five years, and with um, advanced stage disease, one to two percent, in the past few years, we're seeing those numbers improve as therapies become more available and improve as well. What are our goals of therapy in patients with advanced stage disease? I tell my patients, we want to improve your quality of life. We want to improve symptom control. We want to prolong survival. And the question is, will we ever get to cure, even for patients with advanced stage disease? Now, when we look at the different types of therapies that we've seen evolve in the treatment of small cell lung cancer, from the 1970s to the, 1970s to the 1990s, chemotherapy was really our backbone of treatment. We went from using um, multiple different uh, three-combination chemotherapy regimens um, in the 1970s and 1980s, and it was over 30 years ago that platinum-based chemotherapy, which is platinum and etoposide, really became standard of care. And now in 2018, checkpoint inhibitors are increasingly playing a role in the treatment of this disease. So why haven't we made progress? Multiple reasons. Many of the chemotherapies and targeted therapies that have worked in non-small cell lung cancer have actually been tried, but the trials have not been successful in advancing care for patients with small cell lung cancer. For non-small cell lung cancer, for many years, we've talked about molecular profiling, but molecular profiling in small cell lung cancer has not identified what we refer to as an actionable mutation. An actionable mutation means that there's something present in that tumor cell that we can target potentially with an oral therapy that could improve patient's disease. We found different disease, we found different genes, genes like P53 and RB, that can suppress tumor growth and all, are almost, almost always mutated in small cell lung cancer. But unfortunately, we actually have not been able to target these genes. And in, increasingly in lung cancer, we talk about biomarkers so that we can predict who will benefit for the new next line of therapy that we discover, but we don't have great reliable biomarkers in small cell lung cancer at this time. Now, we hear a lot about immunotherapy. You see commercials on TV for immunotherapy. You go on websites and you hear about immunotherapy. So really, what is immunotherapy in lung cancer? When we think about cancers, we know that cancers can express something called antigens. Now, antigens aren't unique to cancer cells. Viruses uh, express antigens, bacteria express antigens, and in the majority of these cases, antigens will present to antigen-presenting cells or dendritic cells, and as a result of these um, presentations, they will actually upregulate the immune system and T cells within our own immune system will go off and fight these viruses and fight these bacteria. However, we know that in cancer cells, upregulation um, can result in trafficking of T cells into the tumor microenvironment, but once they actually hit the tumor microenvironment, we have inhibition by something called PDL1, which is expressed on tumor cells binding to PD-1, which is expressed on those T cells, that it actually dampen the immune response. And so the hope is that we can somehow affect this PD-L1, PD-1 interaction between the T cell and the tumor cell to somehow make our own bodies recognize cancer as foreign. Now, some of the drugs that are out there are doing exactly this. This is a picture of a tumor cell where we see the tumor cell expressing PDL1, and here we see the T cell expressing PD1, and so we see this binding of the PD1 to the PDL1 blocking an immune reaction. There are drugs that target both PD1 as well as PDL1 that are currently FDA approved or in clinical development that prevent this negative interaction from occurring, so the T cell can potentially recognize your tumor cell as foreign and started attacking the own, your own tumor cell. So what are these drugs? Uh, these drugs are um, referred to as immunotherapy. 
Um, and we know that the PDL1 that's expressed in the tumor cell in non small cell lung cancer can potentially predict response to immunotherapy in that tumor type. However, for non small cell lung cancer, approximately 70% of non small cell lung cancers will express PDL1. While in small cell lung cancer, we know that expression is lower. It's only seen in about 10% of patients. The other thing that we hear about a lot is tumor mutation burden as being a potential predictor of response to immunotherapy drugs. And we know that cancers associated with smoking tend to have more mutations and have a higher tumor mutation burden, and small cell lung cancer definitely fits within that pattern. This is data that we've seen um, from something called the, can uh, the Cancer Genome Atlas Project that looks at the number of mutations that are present within a cancer cell, and you see that small cell lung cancer is number five. What I'll highlight as well is that melanoma, non-small cell lung cancer, and bladder cancer hit above small cell lung cancer in terms of having a higher tumor mutation burden, but these are all tumors in which immunotherapies have been found to be effective and in many cases are currently FDA approved. The other tumor types where we're seeing efficacy are also tumor types in where we see this high mutation burden, such as esophageal cancer, um, head and neck cancers, and some lymphomas. So the good news is that immunotherapies appear to be working in a select cohort of, not, of small cell lung cancer patients. In August this year, Nivolumab was approved as third-line therapy for patients with small cell lung cancer, and I'm going to show you some of the reasons why. And recently, there was a large trial called Empower 133, which I was lucky enough to be a, a part of, where atezolizumab was added to platinum and etoposide chemotherapy and was found to improve survival, and in my mind has become a new standard of care and option for small cell lung cancer patients. It's currently included in something called the NCCN guidelines, which is the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, which helps it, um, oncologists around the U.S. in um, deciding on appropriate therapies for um, treatment for their lung cancer patients, although I will mention that it is not yet FDA approved in this indication. So how did we get even the volumab approved at first? So this was a trial called Checkmate 032. Checkmate 032 was a large trial which we were lucky enough to be a part of, and we had several patients enrolled, that looked at nivolumab with a second drug called ipilimumab, which is approved in melanoma, in patients with solid tumors, including patients with small cell lung cancer. When trials are often conducted, at first we're trying to figure out which drug should we give at what dose and what are the side effects of this drug, and so that was the initial purpose of Checkmate 032. But when we started seeing some hints of efficacy in the non-randomized cohort of patients enrolled in this trial, they enrolled even more small cell lung cancer patients and treated them both with nivolumab alone or with the combination of nivolumab and ipilimumab. And patients, unlike chemotherapy, where we might give four to six cycles of treatment and then stop therapy because the chemotherapy can start weighing in on person, patients' fatigue and toxicities, in this trial, patients were allowed to continue um, the treatments indefinitely. And what we saw in this trial was that the response rates with nivolumab alone were good. They were around 12%, but we saw even better response rates with combinations of nivolumab and ipilimumab. We saw that the survival rates with nivolumab and nivolumab and ipilimumab were even better than what we see with traditional chemotherapy in the second and third line setting. And we saw that there was maybe a hint that high tumor mutation can predict response to nivolumab and ipilimumab, but it didn't really predict response to nivolumab alone. There was recently a press release from a large phase three trial that looked at nivolumab alone in the second line setting in patients with non-small cell lung cancer, comparing it to standard of care with a drug called topotecan, which is what we use in the U.S or amarubicin, which is a drug that is generally used outside of the U.S. Unfortunately, this press release was negative. Um, this trial was negative, and they told us that nivolumab did not improve survival for small cell lung cancer patients compared to topotecan or amarubicin, 
And so that tells us that maybe this is not a drug that we're going to be using alone in the second line setting after patients who have had chemotherapy, um, but we're still waiting to see what the results are for the study, who were the patients who benefited, who were the patients who did not benefit, and is there a role for nivolumab alone in the second line setting in patients with small cell lung cancer? There's another drug called pembrolizumab, which is currently approved in small cell lung cancer, that's also being looked at in people who have progressed on chemotherapy in the second line setting. And this trial, similar to Checkmate 032, is giving pembrolizumab alone to small cell lung cancer patients for up to two years of therapy. The initial data that we've seen with pembrolizumab, um, this um, graph on the left-hand side here shows us that 107 patients were enrolled. They specifically looked at patients who were PD-L1 positive, and they showed us that 42 patients in this trial were PD-L1 positive compared to 50% who were negative. And what they showed us that if they were PD-L1 positive, that you maybe had a better response to pembrolizumab compared to those patients who were PD-L1 negative, and that your survival, if you're a PD-L1 positive, was also better than if you were PD-L1 negative. Now, the trial I mentioned before, Checkmate 331, enrolled patients regardless of PD-L1 status. And so maybe it's patients in the second line setting who are PD-L1 positive or a group of patients who are going to benefit from therapy with immunotherapy alone. But we'll have to wait until we have more data with pembrolizumab. And we'll also have to wait until we see more data from Checkmate 331. Now, one of the things that we often think about in oncologists is that's great that we have the backup plan if chemotherapy doesn't work, but what could we do up front when patients first get diagnosed that we could potentially improve their survival? And that's where Empower 133 comes in. This was a global phase three trial that allowed patients with a newly diagnosed stage four small cell lung cancer, extensive stage small cell lung cancer, to be enrolled on study. Now, up to now, the standard of care would have been carboplatinum and etoposide, and that's why one arm of the study, so half the patients who were enrolled in the study, got carboplatinum and etoposide by itself. And then the other patients in the study were enrolled in what we would refer to as the experimental arm, where they got carboplatinum, etoposide, and atezolizumab for four cycles, and then were continued on a tezolizumab alone, while the patients who were on standard of care continued on placebo alone. The goal of this study, because it was a phase three trial, was to improve overall survival. My goal as an oncologist in my patients is not only to improve their response, to improve how their progression or how long they're on that first-line therapy, but again, to improve the chances of overall survival. What we saw is the patients who were enrolled in the study were the patients that we expect to see with small cell lung cancer. The median age of the patients enrolled was 64, a little bit younger than the average cancer um, diagnosis, which is 72 in the US for non-small cell lung cancer. Although I will highlight often for clinical trials, we will see a slightly younger patient population enrolled. We can see that the majority of the patients um, that majority of patients enrolled were smokers, and um, more than half of the patients enrolled were former smokers, so people who quit smoking more than a year ago. When we talk about the patient's ECOG performance status, that just refers to how healthy the patients were when they were enrolled in the study. A patient who has a performance status of zero is able to do everything with no limitations. A patient who has a performance status of one is maybe a little bit limited and can do light housework, but is not able to do everything that they would normally do, which is a common um, thing we find in patients with a lung cancer diagnosis. We can also see that not many patients had had disease in their brain, but for small cell lung cancer, many of the patients did have disease that had spread to the liver. This is the most important curve that we see in this um, trial. This is called the Kaplan-Meier curve. And on the bottom here, we have how many months patients that were on therapy. And on the side, we have the overall survival for patients who were enrolled in the study. And what we can see is that the patients treated with carboplatinum, etoposide, and atezolizumab had a better overall survival than those patients who were treated with chemotherapy alone. 
that at one year, 51% um, of patients who were treated with the combination therapy were still alive, compared to 40% of patients who were still alive in the carboplatinum arm alone. And we can see that there was a two-month improvement in overall survival for patients who were treated with the itezolizumab, making this a very positive study. We also looked at the response to therapy, and what we did find is that small cell lung cancer is a very treatment-responsive disease. And so the treatment did not necessarily improve the response to therapy um, in patients uh, treated with um, combination therapy, um, and it also did not necessarily improve how long patients who responded responded to therapy. We also looked at different groups to figure out, is this something that should be given to all patients? Um, and so what we can see is that there was a benefit both in male and female patients, that there was a benefit in patients regardless of how healthy they were when they were first enrolled in study. We can see that one of the things that did not predict response, as I mentioned previously with nivolumab and ipilimumab, was tumor mutation burden, while in our study, tumor mutation burden did not appear to be a good predictor of response to treatment with um, carboplatinum etoposide and atezolizumab. What we also saw was this is a very safe regimen to give, that most patients did not have significant toxicities and that the majority of patients were able to continue on therapy with very few patients having toxicities requiring them to stop treatment with carboplatinum, etoposide, and atezolizumab. And what we can also see is that the patients who got carboplatinum, etoposide, and atezolizumab um, had uh, the medium number of doses, so the number of treatments that patients received was seven treatments, which corresponds to around 21 um, weeks of therapy, and there are even some patients who are out as far as um, 90 weeks of therapy with each treatment given three weeks apart. There are multiple ongoing trials with immunotherapy and small cell lung cancer. There are multiple different immunotherapy drugs that are currently approved in non-small cell lung cancer. Nivolumab is approved, Pembrolizumab is approved, Durvalumab is approved, and Atezolizumab is approved. And in small cell lung cancer, there are ongoing trials looking at these immunotherapy drugs um, in patients both with early stage disease, as well as now that we've seen benefits in patients with more advanced stage disease, what we're trying to do is move the treatments up earlier into patients' initial diagnosis to see if we can cure more patients diagnosed with limited stage disease. So beyond immunotherapy, what are the other drugs that we're looking at in small cell lung cancer? One of the other drugs that we're looking at are called antibody drug conjugates. I mentioned before that tumors express antigens, and so sometimes antigens that are expressed on tumor cells can actually be used to target the tumor cells with specific chemotherapies. And so the way that anti-drug conjugates work is that there's always the there's a, always a specific antibody, and this antibody has a very specific linker. But what differs is the, the, the chemotherapy drug that is attached to that linker. And the way that the chemotherapy drug works is that these drugs are manufactured, that, these, that the antibody will specifically recognize an antigen present on a, on a tumor cell. It will grab onto that tumor cell and release the chemotherapy, what we call the cytotoxic payload, directly into the tumor cell. And so there's a lot of excitement with different antibody drug conjugates that are being looked at both in small cell as well as in non-small cell lung cancer. So the first antibody drug conjugate that we heard about was Rova-T. Um, there was a trial called the Trinity trial where Rova-T is a drug that specifically targets something called DLL3, which is a protein that is expressed in small cell lung cancer. And so it is supposed to be a potential target for um, antibodies to bind and target small cell lung cancer in patients. There was a lot of excitement for Rova-T in small cell lung cancer. However, we've seen quite a bit of toxicity with this drug in small cell lung cancer patients. And so 
development of Rova-T is currently on hold for small cell lung cancer patients. However, that doesn't mean that we've lost faith in DLL3 or other antibody drug conjugates for small cell lung cancer. And there are ongoing trials with AMG757, which also targets DLL3 in patients with small cell lung cancer, as well as AMG119, which has a different target on small cell lung cancer. But again, these drugs are being looked at in small cell lung cancer. There are multiple trials um, that you can find for patients with small cell lung cancer. And so a whole other group of drugs that I think we're going to see a lot of progress and new treatment options in the upcoming years. Now, finally, the drug to talk about, because I do think we'll be hearing about this sooner than later, is a drug called lubronectidin. It's a drug that has an orphan drug designation by the FDA. And it's actually more, it's a chemotherapy drug where it inhibits a specific um, pathway in um, DNA, uh, in DNA repair and results in DNA double strands breaks and results in death in cancer cells. Lubronectidin is also a drug that can potentially um, affect the tumor marker environment. Um, and so it's a drug that um, we're seeing a lot of progress and promise in small cell lung cancer patients. The promise has come out from a clinical trial where we are looking at um, lubronectidin alone, but we've also seen data with lubronectidin in combination with um, uh, doxycycline um, and docetaxel, for, as well as paclitaxel, for patients with small cell lung cancer. This is the response rates that we've seen to date that have been um, presented. Now, I mentioned before that we weren't surprise when we saw um, cisplatinum and carboplatinum and etoposide or carboplatinum etoposide and atezolizumab not improving that initial response rate to small cell lung cancer with a response rate of 64%. What I didn't mention is that often when patients have had their first line chemotherapy, the next chemotherapy just doesn't work as well. And so the response rates that we'll normally see will be lower. They'll be in the 10% uh, response rate for topo TCAN, which is what is currently FDA approved, or anywhere from 10 to 20% with some of the newer drugs um, that are in development. But with the combinations of lubronectidin and um, doxorubicin, we're seeing response rates of up to 70%. Um, but even with lubronectidin alone, we're seeing response rates of 36%. And we're seeing responses that are lasting for several months in patients who are treated with this drug. Um, this is, again, just a reminder of some of the ongoing trials with immunotherapy and small cell lung cancer, but also to mention that we will see the results with lubronectidin in small cell lung cancer, hopefully presented um, in, the, in the upcoming year, um, potentially offering a new treatment options for small cell lung cancer if the phase three trial turns out to be as good as what we've seen from the phase one studies. So we have made some progress in small cell lung cancer. We know that with immunotherapy, PD-L1 expression is a bit lower in small cell lung cancer compared to non-small cell lung cancer. We know that single agent activity with immune checkpoint inhibitors is lower in small cell lung cancer compared to non-small cell lung cancer. But we finally made progress with the tezolizumab with chemotherapy is better than chemotherapy alone, particularly in patients with advanced stage disease. The antibody drug conjugates have shown activity in small cell lung cancer. We're figuring out some of the toxicity issues because quality of life is an important part of care. And there are ongoing phase one trials in patients um, with tumors that express DLL3 and specific other targets. We know that lubronectidin has shown promise in the second line treatment in studies um, ongoing comparing it to standard of care and hopefully we'll see some of those results in the upcoming year. We still need better biomarkers um, to help us figure out who we should give what therapy to and who will benefit from these new treatments. But with ongoing research and a resurgence in interest in small cell lung cancer, I think that we're, going, we're definitely going to get there um, in the um, upcoming years. I'd now like to hand over um, to Nina, who's going to talk to us, about her small cell lung cancer. Oh. Hi, everybody. Um, 
That was really great, Dr. Horn. Um, you really spoke about really my, the medical side of my story, which is very positive for everybody. So I'm going to start now. Um, I'm Nina Beatty, and I've been invited to talk to you today um, about my experience of small cell lung cancer. I'm about to turn 65 this December, which I'm lucky enough now to celebrate. Um, <clears throat> until I got small cell lung cancer, I'd been healthy. I was minding my own business, being an art therapist, in a small town outside of New York City. I saw clients, texted with my daughter who lived in Chicago. I did Pilates. I cooked homemade soups to share with other single friends. And I was not smoking cigarettes because I had given up my pack and a half day habit when I was 30. So I had no symptoms. How on earth did I find out that I had cancer? Well, thanks to my mother is how. In January of 2014, I visited my mother who had been diagnosed with lung cancer a decade before, but now wasn't doing so well. That day, her radiologist popped by for a visit, and based on my history, she suggested I, too, get a low-dose CT scan. And something told me to go get that scan. Good thing I did, because that's how I was diagnosed with small cell lung cancer. Although it was caught early, my oncologist warned me about using the Internet to research my cancer. He said one problem is that many sites aren't updated with the newest treatments that might be available. And that's why you all are fortunate to have the latest updates from Dr. Horn today. But when I was diagnosed immuno back in 2014, um, immunotherapy wasn't a first line treatment for uh, option for small cell. The standard protocol was chemotherapy and radiation and, uh, and Dr. Horn mentioned cisplatin and those guys. And even with treatment, survival rates were low. No matter how encouraging my family members were, ah, you're going to survive this, Nita. Someone has to be the outlier, and we know it's going to be you. I secretly felt doomed. I knew I had to get the best treatment I could find and get it fast. Um, I went through chemo and radiation, and then a prophylactic whole brain radiation or irradiation. A side effect of my chemo experience was hearing loss, and I've had to wear hearing aids ever since. I didn't let it bother me. I mean, I was still alive, wasn't I? Um, the radiation didn't hurt, although the skin on my chest looked as raw as roast beef for some time afterwards. The prophylactic radiation in my brain didn't hurt at all either, but deciding if I should try to if I could go get it, if I should get it to prevent the cancer was going um, from the cancer going to my brain was the, the most dif difficult decision I had to make about my treatment. I can't even talk about it. <laughs> That's how bad it was, but um, I did get through it. Um, it uh, so about six months later, a second tumor showed up in my abdomen. The cancer had metastasized all over my body, but it's definitely on the move. Still, the doctors remained positive about my situation and suggested I enroll in a clinical trial. They contacted a local hospital known for doing excellent research and running many clinical trials to see if there was one for a small cell lung cancer patient like me. I was lucky again. There was one slot left in an immunotherapy trial using nivolumab or its brand name, Updevo. The fusion was to be for an hour, once every two weeks, and wasn't so bad, really. The decision to enter the immunotherapy clinical trial was easy. I knew my hospital was on the forefront of cancer treatments, and I did not hesitate for one minute about joining the trial. I wasn't scared. I read the paperwork on the potential harms of immunotherapy, but frankly, I hardly took it in because I knew I had to try something new to halt my cancer or else I'd die. The goal is to do something, find a trial or get access to a drug that might help you fight off your lung cancer. This is the area where LCA excels, so use their support resources as often as you need to, because that's what LCA is for. 
I stayed on Updevo because it seemed to stop my tumors from growing from the moment I started using it, and I only had minor side effects. My thyroid levels went down, so I have had to take a low dose of Synthroid, and I've had skin irritations that can only be soothed by a special lotion. Mainly, though, it was an experience of one high five after another between me and my oncology team members as we watched the tumors shrink. A few months ago, when I began having some GI problems, my oncologist decided it was time for me to stop the immunotherapy. The cancer had not shown up as active in the CT scans for several years. So, in the span of four years, I had gone from being someone with metastasized small cell lung cancer to being an NED, no evidence of disease. How unbelievable is that? How could I be so lucky to be born during a time when drugs such as this were invented? I felt how I imagined peace people must have felt when the polio vaccine came out. There had been little hope and then Wham, suddenly there is hope. Okay. Um, is it, sorry. Uh, let's see. Okay. So um, now here are five hopefully helpful tips. Um, if you're a type A and you need to be in control all the time, having a fast moving cancer like small cell lung cancer is not going to allow you much time to gather all the data you probably feel you need to make to consider what you would consider would be your best decision. And I say to you, um, you're gonna have to trust yourself that you are making the best decision you can with the information you have at the time. Sometimes you are being asked to take a leap of faith. That's just the way it is. Um, another one. I didn't cry at all about having cancer, not once, until it was over. Because to get through it, I had to numb myself from, my, from any feelings of fear and despair. You may have a totally different response. Cry, make sarcastic jokes, but whatever it is, be kind to yourself. Don't beat yourself up or let others judge you for how you're reacting. It's your cancer, not theirs. In the lung cancer support group I attended, we traded stories about the stupid, insensitive things people would say or do in front of us. I just tried to let it blow by me, telling myself they don't have cancer, so they just don't know better or they would be more understanding. Cancer can be a lonely, scary business though. If you're up for a support group or need any kind of support, be it mental, physical, or spiritual, I say go for it. If someone asks if they can help, they will feel better if you actually do some, if you let them do something for you. So say yes to that homemade pie or offer to do the late night dog walk or quick food shop for you. Finally, while not everyone can make art, if you can find your way to relax or work out your feelings about having cancer, it'd probably be a good thing to do. To sort out my feelings, I drew cartoons depicting the ironies and inconsistencies of trying to shoot for surviving a cancer with such low odds. Those cartoons ended up becoming the Empath Project, Jennifer Invention. The idea came to me while I was stuck in the treatment chair for hours getting my initial chemotherapy. I was bored and texting friends to update them on how I was doing but the preloaded emojis on my phone seemed devoid of feelings and of real expression. For example, a round yellow emoji with a faucet of tears running down its face could not express the sad, quiet despair I was feeling about my illness. The emoji roosters and flamenco dancing ladies I'd sent when healthy now seemed irrelevant. I wasn't confident I could design emojis, but having received a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Film with a major in animation and a master's in art therapy, this was my skill set, cartooning coupled with self-expression. 
and to keep myself positive and entertained, I had already begun drawing those cartoons about the ups and downs of dealing with cancer. I found wonderful people to help turn my cartoon sketches into a set of animated emojis. My characters, Em and Pat, and the situations they find themselves in are 100% based on my own experience as a cancer patient and the result of asking others a simple question. What emoji would you want to see be made that would directly speak about your experience with cancer? From that, I compiled a list of feelings ranging from gratitude to sadness, fear and anxiety, to hopefulness and joy, all of which you see in the impact animated emojis. From the beginning, I always thought of this as a legacy project, a contribution of something hopeful I could leave in the world. Taking on this project had a positive effect on me. It kept me focused and engaged on something other than thinking of myself solely as a cancer person. Of course, the impact emojis are about having cancer, but in this case, I could do something about the cancer. I could talk about it, inquire with others about it, reveal what's odd and unique about it, and be thankful I could find the humor in it to keep me going. I'm a changed person after going through five years of dealing with small cell lung cancer. These days, I'm much calmer and more loving because of having so close, come so close to death. Early on, I realized it was about learning how to adapt. Now that I've been lucky enough to survive small cell lung cancer, I feel a new urgency to share my story, to give others hope that they also have the strength to get through this exceptionally stressful period in their life. It will take a lot of patience and honesty towards yourself, spreading around as many thank yous as you can, and knowing that no matter what happens, you have the choice to move towards the light. Thank you. Jennifer? Thank you so much, Nina, as well as to Tony and to Dr. Horn for providing such good input. Um, Nina, can you mute your line? Can I what? Oh, yes. Mute your line. Sure. Great. So thank you so much for your story, all of your stories, and for all the teachings we've learned today about small cell. We have a few minutes left for questions, but before we do that, we want you to know that you and your loved ones can download the empath emojis that Nina was just talking about from your favorite app store. Um, everyone can continue to ask questions in the question box for the last few minutes. Um, but we will start, and if you have questions after the webinar that you think of, or if we don't get to your question today, you can email us at support at lungcancerlliance.org, and we will respond to your question via email. So the first question that we've gotten, which I think would be great for all of you to weigh in on, because there may be different perspectives, is how important is it who your oncologist is during this process? Um, I, I guess I'm happy to start, and um, obviously um, Nina and Tony would have more to say. Um, you know, I, I think you need to have an oncologist that you know that you can trust. Um, I think my job is a lot easier than most lung cancer patients are treated in the community. Um, and being at an academic center, it's a little bit easier because all I treat is lung cancer, and all I have to know about is lung cancer. Um, and so I often see patients who come to us for a second opinion, and what I tell people is if you're happy with who you're seeing and I would, and you're getting standard of care, so, you know, there isn't a trial, then if you can get your treatments closer to home with your family, then that's great. But if treatment's not working or if I see a patient we have something different that we can offer, um, then I will tell that patient, you know, that's good, but maybe this is better. Um, but then it's also figuring out the travel and the commitments and what's involved in potentially going 200 miles for a clinical trial. Um, I think it never hurts to get a second opinion, um, and I've never referred a patient back to their local oncologist and said, here's what we would do at Vanderbilt, and they are like, nope, we're doing something different. But I think as long as you have the trust in the relationship with your oncologist, that's such an important part of your care. 
Hi, this is Tony. Um, I'd like to add to that that the, the relationship that develops bet between you and your oncologist is the key feature I have found with my oncologist, who I still see to this day, 26 years plus out. Uh, you know, you share a history with one another. Uh, and in that way, you can trust what he's telling you and, and trust in his coaching and guidance for the process. So I think it's a key issue in treatment is, is the relationship that you have with your oncologist. Thanks. Um, this is Nina. Um, I really like what the other two people said. Um, my only thing is that I, as a patient to patient volunteer, I've heard people tell sort of um, really sad stories about their really their oncologist. And I, I sort of feel like if you are not confident, really try very hard to go someplace else, no matter no matter where you live, because that's I think it's a, such a rapidly killing cancer that you better get the best treatment you can find wherever that is. That's great. And it's Jennifer, I'll add from an LCA perspective that like Dr. Horn said, we do often recommend second opinions um, to make sure you feel comfortable with the care that you're receiving. And also the LCA numbers and email address that we gave out before can help you find a treatment center to go to either as an initial treatment or for a second opinion. Um, one other question specifically to you, Tony, we had a question about how your cancer was discovered and how you were diagnosed oh. and staged and if you had a CT. Uh, interesting. I had, um, because I worked in pretty much uh, a service delivery system dealing with uh, impoverished individuals, uh, you know, we had to have the TB screening annually. And the year that I had my TB screening, uh, I reacted positively to the routine testing. So they said I had no symptoms. The only symptom I had was fatigue, and I attributed that to a, to a new job that I was involved with. So uh, I had my test, and they said, "Nope, you looks like you have TB." <laughs> so uh, because they took the scan, and all they saw was just uh, you know a, a white uh, flush of stuff going on in my left lung so you know it proceeded and uh, i did not and that was a challenge too because people come into your room because you're now quarantined quarantined because you have tb so people come into your room looking like space people you know they're t entirely masked from head to toe um so that went on for a couple of days until they cleared me as not having tb and the rest unfolded you know as the the discovery and and just part two of this is they they did a, a mediastinoscopy in my neck and it came out clean so i danced home i don't have anything and then uh, a s local surgeon called me he had he had read the, the scan and he said no you got to come back in this is bad this is a wrong um final point for you so i had to go in have another mediastinoscopy, and that's where it was diagnosed on the second mediastinoscopy. Great. That answers nice. the question. Yeah. yeah. No, that was great. Thank you. Unfortunately, I think we're out of time for today. As we said, we can um, accept additional questions through the chat box or by email. Thank you so much to all of you for joining us. We hope that the webinar has provided everyone valuable information on new and emerging treatments for small cell lung cancer and that you've been as inspired as I've been by the survivor stories. Um, you will be able to watch this presentation again, as well as to see others in our webinar series. To do that, visit the Lung Cancer Alliance YouTube page under the videos tab. Um, again, Lung Cancer Alliance is here to answer questions about small cell lung cancer, immunotherapies, and we have a lung match treatment and trial navigation program that can talk to you about treatment options as well as clinical trials that might be right for you. We're just a call or email away. Um, and a huge special thank you to survivors Tony Forrester and Nini Beatty for sharing their experiences as well as to Dr. Leora Horn for helping us understand more about the treatment for small cell lung cancer and what's on the horizon. We really appreciate the dedication all of you show to improving the lives of people diagnosed with lung cancer. And thank you to everyone who joined us today to learn more about the new advances in lung cancer and hear the stories of our two survivors. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks.